It's the most exotic and revered predator on Earth. The tiger needs no introduction, but soon it may need an epitaph. A deadly trade is close to wiping out the species. It's a race against time. But conservationist Anthony Marr is convinced that the Bengal tiger still has a chance before the world waves goodbye to the last wild tigers. The dawn sun creeps through the mist at Bandargarh National Park. This is India's forest heartland, timeless and untouched. For centuries, this exquisite setting was the hunting preserve of the Maharaja of Rewa. Now it's a safe haven for India's rich wildlife. But this is the animal that Anthony Marr has come to see. It just gets right into the core of my soul. There is no adjective that is adequate to describe its beauty, its magnificence. It's, it's just the most beautiful animal on earth that I have ever seen. When I see a tiger in the, in the forest, it's a magical feeling. Merely knowing that it exists without even seeing it is a, is a, is a magical feeling. And, uh, and I know that if the tiger is gone from this land, this land will have lost its soul. It was seven million years ago that the tigers of the world originated in what is now Manchuria in the northeast of China. This was the dominant predator that feared no other animal a solitary beast, chiefly nocturnal, that kept to itself, a little like our domestic cats, and just as likely to keep the neighbors cursing their feline turf wars. Anthony Marr is no stranger to Bandafgar National Park, it's one of the success stories in tiger conservation in India, and he's come back here to find out for himself how the tiger population is faring in a very hostile world. But seeing tigers here is no foregone conclusion. They've over 400 square miles of wooded territory to hide in. Of course, on the roads they leave their telltale tracks, the pug marks that tell you who passed by and when. No one blames you for looking over your shoulder. And how fast it is? In the morning. In the morning? About 7 o'clock. About 7 o'clock, so it's about 5 hours from now. Yes. Can you identify this tiger? Yes. Mm -hmm. The name of this tiger is Bada Bacha. Big baby. Bada Bacha. Bada Bacha. Bada Bacha. Now we it is a cub of Sita. A cub of Sita? Oh, cub I see. Sita. I see. It is a very heavy tiger. This is Charger, Brabricha's dad, and no lightweight himself, the most famous of the Bandafgar tigers, who got his name scaring the wits out of tourists by charging at their elephants. Charger's mate Sita has produced 18 cubs over the last 11 years, yet just seven made it to adulthood, a high mortality rate that concerns Anthony Marr when he considers the future for the species. In all, Bandargarh is home to perhaps 40 tigers, but no one knows for sure. 
marking their territories like a cat with urine and tree scratching, male tigers will patrol up to 50 square miles of forest, giving other males a wide berth. The females are interested in a territory only for prey and to protect her cubs, often within or straddling a male's domain. However, his main concern is a territory that holds a large harem of females for breeding. It's not possible to think of India without thinking of tigers. At the turn of the century, there were upwards of 100,000 tigers across the whole of India. The British Raj and their Indian cohorts to turn into a national blood sport. Grandiose killing parties gave visiting kings and courtiers the bloody chance to bag a skin for the living room floor. It was all good fun. Trophy hunting was the first scourge of the tiger. One Maharaja chalked up about 3,000 plus tigers, all killed by himself. And that is amazing because if you count all the tigers in India today, there is not 3,000. When the British left, tiger numbers still stood at 30,000. But 20 years later, in the late 60s, a national census recorded a knife-edge national population of only 1,800 animals. In a state of alarm, Indian conservationists convinced the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, that the tiger was in real danger of extinction. She responded by placing a total ban on trophy hunting, forcing state governments to afford tigers protection, and in 1972, she set up Project Tiger with the clear aim of turning the tide. Mrs. Gandhi's Project Tiger got underway and central to the plan was the creation of new tiger reserves. Now the tiny tiger population could settle down in peace and with some security, get on with what the world expected of them. Tiger nature being what it is, we were not to be disappointed. Project Tiger was an undoubted success. Within 10 years, the population almost doubled and the world breathed a sigh of relief. Yet the dice are still loaded against these little kittens. Tigers are born blind and helpless in a well-hidden den, and their eyes don't open until their second week of life. The mother's alone with no mate to help her. And when she has to leave the den to hunt, the cubs are at the mercy of every passing jackal, wild dog or python. Even another tiger might make a quick snack out of them. So it's good going for a wild tigress to raise more than one cub to maturity every year. And yet for those that do survive to adulthood, the hope for continued survival and success for the species will ultimately depend on a well-stocked forest larder. Tigers can make 10 or more attempts before being rewarded with a kill. Patience and tenacity are their virtues that ensure them a full stomach. 